Hey everybody, welcome back to another Fly Tying Tuesday. My name is Steve, and today we're tying up a pretty special fly. This is Joe's Mini Crayfish, uh, designed by Signature Tire and Rod Designer Joe Goodspeed. Um, so like I said, this is a, this is a cool fly. It has a, a bit of a cult following, kind of a if you know, you know sort of thing about it. Um, for a lot of people, this particular fly has been a bit of a, uh, I wouldn't say a cheat code, but a, some, it has unlocked the, the potential of catching some pretty large fish on um, marginal waters where um, if a river can support a given amount of biomass, but it's a lower fish density, a lot of situations like this exist in the northeast where I'm from. Um, that allows for some pretty large specimens um, that are few and far between. So if you have found one that has a, a reliable diet of smaller crayfish, this is the fly for you. Um, however, have no fear. Um, I've put it to the test and it certainly catches trout in the Rocky Mountains as well. Um, Right here we have a version that is tied with eyes. Uh, we will definitely link the eyes and the material, so if you want to tie one like this, you definitely can. Um, it's fun to show your friends, but as far as production tying, you can omit the eyes, and I promise you the fish will not mind. Um, you can vary it up a little bit. I'm gonna try to stick um, to kind of the core factors of the pattern, and you can kind of go from there. If you find out that um, the local forage of crayfish in your rivers are a little bit more green, try a different color of thin skin. Um, if you need to overweight it or underweight it based on um, if you are sight fishing and you want to dial one in for a particular fish and you have lower water, deeper water, sandy bottom, rocky bottom, figure it out. That's part of the fun of tying your own flies. So um, commercially available from Fulling Mill, this fly is tied uh, without the eyes, uh, it's in uh, six, eights, and tens. Um, but the nice thing about tying it yourself, this fly has really purpose-driven attributes. Um, and one of those is your ability as a tire to weight it very heavily. Um, I don't usually advocate the use of lead on a fly, um, but for the six, eight, and 10, you're gonna use 0 .03, 0 .025, and 0 .02 lead respectively. And that's gonna help it when you're fishing it on a tight line, which is kind of how it's designed to be fished, is a kind of a contact nymphing, euro nymphing setup. You're gonna allow it to meet the substrate and help trigger those fish on their lateral line um, for these small crayfish. So let's get it started. The one I'm gonna do for you guys today, just for demonstration purposes, is the size six. That gives me the most amount of uh, real estate to demonstrate some of these tying techniques. So go ahead and put the Wapsi Super Jig hook uh, in your vise upside down. It's going to be the easiest way to do what you need to do on this fly. Kind of a gnarly hook. I definitely recommend uh, pinching that barb down. Uh, the, the size trout you're going to catch on this um, are definitely going to put these hooks to the test. So you want to make sure you've got the, the most amount of structural integrity to this fly. Um, and we're going to do some things to add to the durability and whatnot that we'll show you along the way. So um, actually before we even start the thread, we're going to come in here um, with that lead for our underbody. So, like I said, the weight is very important with this fly and how it fishes. So wrap that on there, secure it, and we'll try to wiggle it out as flush as you can. If you have an older pair of scissors that you don't care about that much, go ahead and trim it if you need to. And then butt it up to that jig ball. Now we're gonna do something kind of fun. And this fly, I like to say, is a bit of fly tying and a bit of arts and crafts. So you're gonna add some width to this to help sculpt the shape that we need to build out the body and tail of this crayfish. So go ahead, secure your thread. So kind of X wraps, and then you can uh, incrementally add tension to this once you feel a little bit more confident in how secure it is. And I will admit, I'll probably say it more than a couple times while tying this, this fly is ugly underneath. Um, you're going to do some things that don't look super clean, but when it all comes together at the very end, you'll be happy with it. So 
now we're going to start doing some sculpting um, and adding width to this kind of tail section. So we're going to do a strip, another strip of lead along the side on both sides of this to build out that width. Work it down, pull pretty tight, wiggle out. Same thing on the other side. You don't have to be uh, sparse with your thread wraps on this fly, trust me. If you want things to be secure and durable, um, you can always add a few more wraps. We're using a Uni 6 aught in the camel color today. So go ahead and do that. If you have a light pair of hemos, this is not the best thing for your thread. You may see it break or fray, but just gently squeeze and shape and flatten this out and uh, build out the shape. Cool. And then you can go over it to make sure it's secure and durable. So working all the way up to the front, first thing we're gonna do is tie in our antenna. The antenna, it's uh, gonna be some silly legs, some nymph silly legs from Wapsi and the pumpkin solid. Uh, you can do this in a barred uh, variation or like a sparkly one. Uh, this one is um, just a nice natural. Um, a lot of the times when, you know, if you're looking up pictures of river crayfish for reference on the proportions and colors of this fly, um, just an, a subtle kind of transparent orange is, is what you're going to see. Um, but if you do some research and maybe even find one in the rivers that you like to fish and they're a little bit more barred or maybe a little light, lighter or darker, go ahead. There's a lot of colors available on all these materials, so make it your own. Just secure that down nice. Uh, so now we're going to go ahead and add in the antennule. Uh, the antennule is like a secondary antenna that a crayfish has that's a bit shorter and kind of flare out. Um, and this also just gives a nice kind of crustacean-y look. This is sparkle, emerger yarn, and clear white. So this is just a nice little aspect that I like to add um, to this bug. So go ahead and do kind of like a loose gathering wrap and then maybe grab your excess and kind of line it up on top of the shank. This lets you dial in the length and positioning. Um, doesn't need to be too crazy. Honestly, just enough to know that it's there is plenty. And you can trim out some of the super rogue ones. You definitely want um, a different look of, of each. You don't want them to be exactly the same length. And if they're a little bit too crazy, you can kind of come up there and gather them up and keep them a little bit more uh, neat. Cool. So that's looking pretty good. Next, we're going to add the mass and bulk of the head that we need. And this is kind of like the, uh, the feeding appendages or mouth parts of this head. And that's just going to be some coarse um, beaver dubbing. We're going to be using this quite a bit throughout this pattern. Um, this fly definitely eats through a lot of dubbing, so make sure you've got plenty when you set out to tie a bunch of them. Um, but a nice coarse uh, tan dubbing, like this here beaver dubbing, is a great option for it. Um, so you can either do this in a standard dubbing noodle or a uh, dubbing loop. It's up to you as far as the look and fluffiness that you want to have. Um, I would definitely recommend going pretty heavy no matter what you do, but packing that in densely. You don't want it fraying apart or um, just like losing all of its mass while being fished. So I'm going to do just a super healthy uh, dubbing noodle to build up some of the bulk here. The noodle is nice just for getting up and, uh, tight. And that's going to give me a bit of a foundation that's nice and dense. And then I'll double down with just a little dubbing loop. So just a super fluffy clump. 
Um, that noodle helps establish, like I said, that durability. That's definitely a theme throughout this fly and a nice foundation. You can leave some of those guard hairs in there as well. Um, crayfish are pretty leggy, buggy creatures. So if you've got some rogue stuff, it can be kind of fun to just leave it and see how it looks. Go ahead and work your way back up and capture that dubbing loop. If you have any bald spots or areas that you want to soup up, you can add a little bit more dubbing if you want or need. It's looking pretty good. There's a little bit of thread exposed towards the end of it, so I'm gonna go ahead and get that taken care of. And you can kind of spruce this up, fluff it out. Cool, kind of working our way to the more um, robust parts of this fly. This is kind of the more time consuming sculpting pieces and then you can get into some larger actions that build out um, the main part of the crayfish. All right, so at this stage, this is a, a note for those of you that may want to tie the eyes on, like the, the guy that you see down here. Um, this is the stage where I would be adding those eyes in, um, kind of t securing them with just a loose wrap to get it positioned where you want it, um, and then moving that eye around. You don't want them too close or touching. You want them kind of sitting on the side of the hook shank a little bit further apart. Um, crayfish have eyes that are kind of on little rods that move around. Um, so you want them to be flared. Not only does that give you the right look, but having them on the side rather than close together on the top will make sure that you maintain the hook clearance that you want for these fish. So if you're gonna add eyes, now's the time to do it. Um, and then, uh, no matter what you're doing, uh, the next step is going to be the um, it's kind of the skull cap area of the head. This is going to kind of top it all off. It's going to be a tuft of um, guard hairs off of a hair's mask. So this gives a nice finishing shape and color to the top of the head here before we move on. So just um, grab a nice tuft of that about as wide as your fingers can grab and then cut low down to the base and you're gonna have a bunch and maybe some of them don't make it. And then just take, um, you know, you could take your thumbnail if you don't have a dubbing brush handy, but just kind of get out some of those under fur fibers. Um, it'll make it easier to tie in if they're not in there. If you do it with your thumbnail, you do gather it up into your hand and that way makes it just a little bit easier to save this stuff for dubbing the next time you wanna use some hairs here. Um, so then just pinch that get it kind of lined up where you want it, and then transfer it. So I'm gonna bring my thread up and make sure that it's spun counterclockwise. That'll make it so that when I relax my thread and bring it up and around, it'll lay in towards my fingers. And if it's not doing that, it'll um, kind of lay towards the jig ball at the, the back of this fly and make it a lot harder to secure this stuff. Your thread will want to slide off the back of that hair's, um, hair's ear guard fiber. Just spread it out, move it around, get the shape and proportion that you want, and then go ahead and secure it. You could trim out the butts, but we're not too concerned with saving mass and bulk on this fly. It's pretty dense, so just go ahead and cover it up if you need to. <clears throat> All right, that is looking pretty good. Um, so like I said, you'd have the eyes already fixed if you were doing that variation of the fly, but now we're gonna move into the legs and claws, uh, kind of the pincher of this fly. This is built using um, four different colors of Life Flex, light olive, brown, copper, and tan. Um, and you just make a simple overhand knot on the ends of it and you can crank out a bunch of these and then just stage them. That's definitely my uh, recommended method of production tying these guys is 
get all this stuff ready ahead of time. It makes it so much easier on yourself. So we're just gonna fix these on with the same kind of concept, just a loose wrap to get it lined up. And the total claw length target is about 50% of the shank. So you're gonna get it lined up on the side of that and give it a nice little pinch to flare it out at about a 45 degree angle. Pull it tight. Don't go too short because you don't want this claw to just pull out on you if you need to adjust uh, the tension or length or anything. I'm just going to even up the butts of this side and repeat it. That's a little bit long. I'm going to move it in. Another loose wrap. That's looking pretty good. And then bite. I'm just going to clean these up a little bit. Kind of cover this stuff up. You can kind of manipulate these a little bit. That's why I leave them a little bit longer is you can kind of move them if you're looking down the fly and they're like really cockeyed. Um, but crayfish can have different sized claws, so um, you don't need to be a perfectionist with it. All right. Um, so now we're going to get our schloppen tied in before we go ahead and dub the body. This is just going to kind of um, save us a step. This order of operation also keeps you from doubling back with your thread over this body too much once you've had that uh, dubbing established. So get a nice webby schloppen fiber. This is um, a nice pretty good value pack uh, from Whiting. We have these available. You get a ton of schloppen of varying lengths in this particular pack. It's kind of the, the six inch plus um, pack. So I have a variety of feathers in here and I just find uh, the right one for the size crayfish that I'm doing. So prep that by cleaning up a little piece of stem. Take the concave side and face that towards the head. And you're just gonna tie in that stem right behind your legs. And that's gonna get covered up with dubbing so don't worry about it. Now we're gonna make a pretty large dubbing loop. Um, if you have um, a dubbing loop or composite loop tool that kind of stages all your fibers for you, now's a good time to use it. Otherwise, you can just kind of feed it in there a little bit of a, at a time. You're gonna use the same coarse tan dubbing. In my case, that's the, the Wapsi Beaver Dubbing and Tan and um, feed that into your dubbing loop. So it's going to look like a lot. There is um, quite a bit of dubbing involved in this fly. Um, but if you kind of lay things out ahead of time, that can make it a little bit easier to feed it in here. Um, you don't have to worry about including or excluding the guard hairs. Um, whatever happens, happens. Like I said, they're pretty leggy, buggy creatures. So if it's in there, you can dubbing brush it out or whatever you want. And I may or may not get all this at once, but I'm going to try. And if not, like I said, feed it in incrementally. Cool. So like I said, this is uh, looking pretty aggressive. That's fine. It's going to pack down pretty nice. Uh, we can brush a lot of it out. We're going to cover some of it up with a schloppen. If you happen to caption, capture one of your legs, just sneak in there and rescue it. And this is also all going to be tucked under our um, shell back. So any of this really crazy extra stuff, go ahead and get it out of there. All right, we've got our dubbing loop established. We've brushed out some of the really crazy stuff. Um, and now we're just gonna uh, get this all wrapped around here, um, covering up any thread wraps that we may have. It's all gonna be covered up underneath backing material and whatnot. 
and it's gonna be reinforced with thread and schloppen, so I know this is gonna look pretty insane, um, but I promise it's all gonna work out. So I do have some extra, that's fine. Um, when you cut this out, you can kind of pull out that dubbing and save it from that thread and use it on the next one. Kind of preen all this stuff forward, get a couple securing wraps, and go ahead and half hitch. So now I'm going to take um, this nice webby schlop and feather and wrap that around three times. So there's one. And don't be afraid to pull pretty hard if you've got a good strong stem. There's two. And there's three right in front of the, uh, the jig ball there. Get the bobbin cradle out of the way. Climb back up with the thread and secure this guy. One, two, three, and a little half hitch. Again, I know it looks messy, but we will get there. While it's half hitch, take this opportunity to bob and cradle it again if you've got one. If not, no big deal. Take a longer um, bladed scissor and you're gonna trim the schlop in top and bottom just to add a little bit of clearance for our uh, shell back material. Uh, but before you do that, make sure that um, you get these fibers brushed out and parted a little bit. The rest of the fly, we're gonna be you know, finishing off the look of this, but we're also going to be trying to avoid trapping too many of these uh, fibers in the process of doing that. So this helps us get off on the right foot. So you're just going to come about the width of the fly straight in on the top and anything extra watching out for, you know, that tuft of hair's ear that you've got up there, watching out for um, the legs and everything like that and just clean it up. Same thing on the bottom, come straight over the back, clean it up. You can always trim more later, but you can't add more back on. So try to include a lot of legginess on the sides there. Cool. Now to reinforce all this, you're gonna wiggle your thread side to side as you crawl back up with a lot of tension to reinforce the, the schlop in here. All right, we're looking pretty good. So we're gonna go ahead and tie in our backing material now, and that's just some Wopsy Fly Specs Thin Skin. I have it in brown and black. You can change the material on this. Um, you can change the color on it based on what works best for you. I also prep this ahead of time, just like the arms. I just cut a strip of it off the card, and I measure that out to be kind of under the hook point, and then around that jig ball, and about half that distance up again to the hook point. So, same way that we did that little trick with gathering up um, that guard hair for the hair's ear mask, um, I like to make this easier on myself. Give yourself a lot of room to work with because we're gonna make a nice kind of loose gathering wrap, avoiding trapping some of those fibers, and then slide it in, kind of right under that hook point. On these size sixes, you're gonna do three segments, and on the eights and tens, you're gonna do two. Each of these uh, segments should be secured with three tight wraps. So make sure it's even on both sides. Um, when you go to the next segment, you could add dubbing right here um, to cover up any thread. But honestly, there's so much dubbing and schlopping going on that I don't think the fish are really gonna care if there's a little strip of brown underneath there from your thread. So one loose one to gather everything, make sure it's lined up. Pull your backing material kind of taut so you don't have any slop. And then again, one, two, three. And here we go. Get established. This one's a little bit different, so I'm gonna rest it on top of the eye of the hook, see where it's at. Come right up where it's resting with a pin and make a little hole. Then take my scissors pull the backing up, find where you made the pinhole. And make a 
nice little slit for the eyelet to come through. And you can kind of prop it and then use your thumbnail to work it down there without ripping any more than you need to. So again, trying to not trap too many fibers, we can always trim it out and sculpt it when we uh, get done. Make a loose gathering wrap, pulling any excess. And get that to be concave, wrapped around the hook shank. And then the same thing on the bottom, you're gonna pull that forward to shape the tail. And I wanna make sure that I'm gathering it up towards the existing top of the tail. I don't want the material to flop out towards um, kind of an open position. I want to gather it up towards the existing tail. That helps complete the shape um, and gives a better looking profile to it. Don't worry about these, we'll trim them out. Getting close to the finish line, folks. This fly is a marathon, not a sprint. Whip finish, nice and snug. Having the backing wrapped around where all this weight is that we established earlier is another key part of um, this fly coming in contact with the bottom and making those little taps of a crayfish caught up in the current that is going to uh, trigger that lateral line on those fish. So that's a kind of a little kicker bumper right there that's gonna along through the drift. So right now, um, with the thin skin, this is a pretty important step. Take a head cement or finishing resin and coat all of your, all of your work right here, um, especially with the thin skin. Uh, like I said, this fly is about durability and you don't want it to be the weakest link. You know, you want this to last for multiple fish if you can. So I'm gonna give everything a nice little coat of resin. Um, it also gives it kind of a nice um, crayfishy look. So go ahead and give a nice coat. As I finish this fly off, I'll just give some notes on fishing it. Um, you definitely want to beef up your setup if you're going to fish the heavier weighted versions of this fly. Um, you know, you can fish it on a tight line rig, like I said, that's probably the best way to fish it. That's my preferred way of fishing it. Um, you know, size up your tip a little bit because if you're getting, um, you know, really solid eat on this fly, you want to have the protection to land that fish that might be your personal best fish in that given stretch of water or, you know, anywhere depending on, uh, you know, the caliber that you're running into. So uh, make sure that you're prepared in advance for what you may encounter. Um, that goes for all sorts of things in fly fishing. So fishing it on a dead drift is a great way to do it, fishing it on its own. Um, you can also fish it as the point fly in a two fly tight line setup. Um, having it on the bottom, having something a little bit higher up. That dead drift with the occasional twitch or bump along the bottom, you can kind of animate it. And another awesome way to fish this fly is casting it um, a little bit quartering across upstream and doing what's called a cross lead with a tight line or Euro nymphing setup. So casting it across and the weight of that is kind of like a pendulum. If you have a heavy enough fly, depending on the current, its natural position that it wants to sit is directly vertical underneath your rod tip. So if you cast across and animate it through the drift, as it goes down the current, it'll draw towards you and that cording across little bump and glide um, is an awesome way to entice a hungry trout. There you have it guys. I hope it has um, as much success for you as it has had for me and many other people that love this fly. Joe's Mini Crayfish. Thanks for watching.